welcome to Los Angeles, or maybe I get welcome to Los Angeles. We are so happy to be here on behalf of Pacific Union to put on Real Estate Outlook 2020. This is our first year in Southern California, but it, we've just completed our fourth year in the Bay Area. And I'm going to give you a little glimpse into what we uh, talked about in the last three years up there as we move forward uh, with the agenda today. And I'll give you some anticipation for how we're going to close it out today and give you insight into the year 2020. First of all, I want to welcome everybody in the audience. It's such a special audience for Pacific Union because it represents the merging of so many cultures here in Southern California, from Partners Trust and John Arrow to Gibson, um, the Mark Company from uh, Northern California, and finally Empire, which is another business that we acquired earlier this year. So the dynamics of all these firms coming together is truly creating the ultimate California real estate company, and in an unprecedented way is going to change real estate in Southern California. Um, we are doing today in cooperation with John Burns Real Estate Consulting. John Burns, who's going to join us here on the stage in just a few minutes, is the only economist in our industry that I've been able to find, or that we have been able to find, that will give you a forward-looking perspective and analyze all the moving parts associated with our housing market. So this is our first year with John down here, but our fourth up north. I attended the one in New York City on uh, the first week in November. It was fantastic, and I think he's got some, some real dynamic data for you to consume here today. For those of you who are online, you can please join the conversation at PacUnion, hashtag real estate vision. Once again, at PacUnion, hashtag real estate vision. I know we have our colleagues in the La Cunada office and I think also in the Pasadena office watching online. We're also simulcasting this in Mandarin for our friends in mainland China. So <clears throat> flashback, November, 14, November of 2014 when we put on our economic summit. We really shared with the audience after presenting all the data and all the cases that if you're trying to time the market and you want to retire to St. Bart's, the runway is getting really short, okay? We're running out of runway. That is the runway in, in uh, St. Bart's, and that's Nikki Beach, the bar in the background. So they were running out of runway. The top of the market in the Bay Area happened to be, you pick it, May, June, July of 2015. So we kind of nailed that one. Last year in Northern California, the, the message became even more urgent. The clock was ticking, okay? And we, we shared with the a community what buyers, what was motivating buyers, what was the generation, why were they moving, and what was the arbitrage in the market between the job centers and where the growth in the market was coming. We also talk, shared with everybody what sellers were up to, what the generations of sellers were versus buyers. Why were they moving, okay? And then the local housing demand, how did it pan out? So that's what we're going to get to here today. We're going to begin with John sharing with us an outlook of the real estate markets in the United States. Also, uh, some significant data about the job market, specifically here in Southern California. I think you'll enjoy that. Then Selma is going to walk us through some of the tax issues that we're seeing in Washington, D.C. right now. And then she's going to give you a zip code by zip code here in Southern California exactly what's going on in the real estate market. From there, we'll have some Q&A. We'll have microphones at both ends of the aisles, so if you have a question, please come down, ask a question of John or Selma or myself, and then we'll give you the insight into what we think is going to happen in the year 2020. So with no further ado, I want to welcome my good friend and economist, John Burns. Should we welcome him to Southern California by talking about the Dodgers and Giants? Yeah. There you go. Uh, I didn't think so. so. I grew up in Northern California, so I'm a Giants fan. It hurt me, too. Uh, so, yeah, exactly. I, rub it, I'll, I rubbed it in for six years. You can let me have it now. So I'm going to give you a, a national perspective. And my, my agenda here, our company agenda, is really to try to get it right. So uh, if I'm missing something, please hit me in the Q&A or, or tell me afterwards what you're seeing differently. But this, this is what, when we've got offices all over the country, and we did like 600 con local consulting assignments last year. This is what we're seeing nationally. So we rate all the markets uh, and all the maps. Red's going to be bad and green's going to be good. We can't find one market in the country that we call poor right now. Every market is doing OK. There are five markets, 10% of the top 50, that we're calling weak. Bakersfield, Fort Myers, and uh, three markets in the Northeast. <laughs> Almost all of the country, and then someone from Bakersfield chuckled. Um, it's been getting a little better, though, actually. Uh, most of the country looks like this. It's running average. Sales are fine. We're seeing some price appreciation. Sure, things could be better. They're not too hot. They're not too cold. 
And there's another nine markets that I would call strong, and they tend to have a tech orientation to them. San Jose, Reno, San Diego, Riverside, Dallas, uh, Nashville, actually. And then one market, just Seattle, is absolutely on fire. We're calming this one down because the announcement of HQ2 up there, Amazon relocating elsewhere, sent a little confident shock through the market that some of the irrational exuberance we were seeing in Seattle has slowed down. So that's what we're seeing around the country. But then we sit back and go, okay, we look at all the math. We collect a lot of data. And we say, let's look at the fundamentals. How is demand in that market compared to its normal demand? How is supply compared to its normal supply? How is affordability compared to its normal affordability? And if everything's running at average, we say, hey, that's a, that's a normal risk market. If things are a lot better than, than usual, it's uh, very low risk, and worse than usual, very high risk. We can't find one market in the country right now that we would call very high risk when we look at those demand, supply, and affordability factors. I can find a few markets that I would call high risk. Austin has had so much price appreciation. Some of it deserved, but some of it not. Houston just climbed out of a recession. It's actually getting better in Fort Myers. Uh, it's not a very strong market either. But I look around the rest of the country and, and you say it, it's, it's normal risk. And what almost all these markets have in common is there's more demand than there is supply, but affordability is starting to, to become a problem. Then there's a number of markets that really have not recovered and they tend to be in the Midwest and the Northeast and some that have very low risk, Tacoma, Chicago, Minneapolis, and those markets really haven't even recovered. So when you're reading some of the national news, it's a roll up of all these various things. So to have a view on the housing market, you have to have a view on, on mortgage rates, and I'm not smart enough to predict mortgage rates, but there are people that put a lot of money on what the 10-year treasury future is going to be, and mortgage rates trade at a premium over a 10-year treasury, because a typical pool of thousands of mortgages pays off after 10 years. Someone pays it off after five, some people hold it to 30. On average, it's a 10-year hold. The 10-year treasury, the bond market is saying it's gonna only go up 200 basis points over the next three years from an average of 2.4 to 2.6. So that's what the professionals are betting, and if you disagree, you can actually hedge. And then we think the premium over the, more, uh, over the 10-year treasury today is 1.6, which is below normal. We think it's going to rise to normal. One of the reasons it's below normal is the Fed has been buying mortgages to keep it low, and they're start going to stop doing that. So when you add it all up, our, the forecast to us looks like 4.0 to 4.8. 4.8 is still a great rate. That's a 15 to 20 percent hike in payment, though. That's not going to help. So that's what the market is projecting. We also have done a very, very deep dive on demographics, and I presented a lot of this last year, but I'm just gonna give you one, one slide on it now. We actually wrote a, a book on this we published a year ago called Big Shifts Ahead. This is a snapshot of LA County's population by decade born, so you can find your decade on there. Uh, if you are, purple would be 1950s, that would be 1.1 million people, 1.4 million people born in the 60s, 1.4 million in the 70s, et cetera. It's just easier to compare decades to each other than use these Gen X and Boomer and Millennial uh, generalizations that don't really work. What I'm going to tell you is a couple things that are different about Los Angeles. So if I did this chart for the country, the size of that purple uh, column, 1950s, would be the exact same size all the way through the 60s, a little smaller in the 70s, and then a, a little bit bigger in the 80s and 90s. We have a much younger population in LA County than we do nationally, particularly those born in the 1980s. And you can call them millennials if you want. It's better to call them the older millennials because the younger millennials were born in the 1990s. The other massive difference here, and I'm sure there's a lot of people online in China listening to this for this very reason, is we're seeing a lot of immigration. The shaded piece there is the percent of that population that was born in another country. So if you're selling homes to somebody born in the 50s, 60s, or 70s, more than half of them were born in another country. And it's why you need multilingual real estate professionals and a lot of different niches here. And you, you see that starting to trail down when you get to the younger folks. The reason is immigration tends to happen in your 20s and 30s, so that number could, or should, those numbers should go up over time. Although, 
our immigration policy can impact that dramatically. So that gives you the demographics. Then again, sticking with the theme here of red is, is bad and green is good, I'm gonna give you the demand, supply, and affordability for LA County today. There's about 78,000 existing home sales in the last year that is below average. So the way we grade things, a C would be average. It's okay to be a C student in this grading curve. We have a below average, and I don't think I need to emphasize that. We'd all like to see more transactions. The job growth, though, which brings more adults into town who can buy homes, is running at about average of 50,000, and the unemployment rate is now starting to get pretty low at 4.8%. That's actually higher than the country, but it's starting to get pretty low, and a low unemployment rate is going to mean better income growth, and we've been calling for this for some time. I'm a very, very bullish on income growth. One of the reasons we pointed out in the book is we're gonna see a lot of retirement over the next few years, um, and we're gonna have to replace those people. Uh, from an affordability standpoint, we have an affordability index that says zero would be the best affordability ever, 10 would be the worst affordability ever in LA, and five would be the norm. This is an 8.5. And that is looking just at payment. If I looked at price, it would be worse. So there's no doubt we have an affordability problem here. And on our, our home value index, which 100 would be um, 2002, We've seen 129% price, price appreciation here since 2002. Just step back and think about that for a minute. That is very expensive. And then on the supply side, here's where we're all green. And the way we did this, I know you'd like to see more supply, but from a demand supply standpoint, low supply is a, is a good thing. It causes more price appreciation. 5,700 single family permits in um, the entire county in the last year. That's virtually nothing. 16,000 multifamily permits, that's quite a bit, uh, almost to its historical norm, so 22,000 permits. But if we're adding 50,000 adults with jobs and bringing in 22,000 new housing units, that's more than two jobs per housing unit. That's an imbalance, and you have demands running faster than supply. And the way we look at, at uh, months of supply, that's about three months of supply, and I, I know that the months of supply number is very low. One tidbit I'll leave you, though, for those of you that have as gray hair as me, is it's, the new norm is probably about a month and a half to two months lower than you're used to, because when you look at the old norm, you know, it was 30 days to get a listing and have an open house and all those things. Now it could be three hours to put it on the internet and have an offer. So the world has changed due to technology. The months of supply is uh, much more slow, much lower. Looking at our economy, these 10 sectors are about half of the jobs out there. You can see they're all growing. The biggest is food services, though, which only pays 21,000 bucks. Those aren't our home buyers. The one that gets a lot of attention, I'll highlight it in red down there, is the motion picture industry, which is actually shedding jobs. However, that's a very small percentage. That's like 3% of the jobs that are out there. It's not, not significant. And then the publicly traded companies here have generated a lot of wealth. And I know you tend to focus on the high end here. If somebody's working at Bank of America or Boeing or Amgen or Northrop Grumman or Blizzard down in Orange County or CBRE, all those executives with stock options and stock have seen huge increases in their net worth, which have enabled them to become home buyers. And then just wrapping up the, the wonky job stuff, this is job, total jobs by income, and it's highlighted to the left here because this, this is the total jobs in LA that make less than $120,000. You can see the bulk of the jobs are down in the twenty dollars to $60,000, which there's no way those people are buying homes given our affordability. But the job growth right now tends to be skewed to the higher end. You're seeing a lot of job growth in that one forty to two hundred thousand dollar job range, which is a lot of the tech jobs you're seeing here on on the um, west side. John, on, on that slide, is is it the volume of jobs below one hundred and twenty that make the index so unaffordable in Los Angeles County? Yeah, but but the index that we created looked at LA today versus LA's norm, not like a national, yeah. not co compared to other markets. So. The statement that is still not affordable by LA's own history is, is true. And then finally, we have this housing cycle risk index, 
which I'll show you LA. I wish I had charted this back to 2012. In 2012, it was way up the top in green. We had no, no risk at all in the housing market. We're starting to get down to what I'll call normal levels of risk. And our forecast looks like this. The more price appreciation you're going to see, the more risk is in the market. Uh, the more construction that comes into the market, the more risk is in the market. So we, we say demand is normal risk, supply is a little bit higher than normal risk, and most of that's apartment, and affordability is the risk. Not, not really too bad. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Selma Hep, your, your chief economist and your vice president of business intelligence. You're very lucky. I think this is the only real estate agency in all of California that has a chief economist and someone to put a lot of this information together for, for you to use. So Selma, come on up. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. Um, and it is my sincere ple pleasure to be here because although I've been working with Pacific Union for the last couple of years up in the Bay Area, I live here and I have uh, unsuccessfully tried to be a home buyer in California, in LA. Um, and I emphasize the unaffordable part <laughs> or unsuccessful. Um, so all these numbers that I'm going to share with you are very close to my heart. <laughs> <laughs> So before we go into the local housing market numbers, I want to run with you through uh, a series of numbers that look at the impact of taxes. We are all in high anticipation of what's going to happen in the next few days or possibly, you know, by the end of some changes before the end of the year. Uh, but I'm, what I'm looking at here is what happens if a buyer buys a one point two million dollar home and it may seem like a high number but uh, it is about a, a quarter of LA's market and it's a lot of our agents do work in the in the, uh, in these with these numbers so uh, under the current what, what we're currently uh, have is we have a state and local income deductions and with about two hundred thousand dollar income um, I, I underestimated this number but let's say it's about thirteen thousand dollars in state and local income de uh, deductions then we have if you buy a uh, $1.2 million home, on the first year of your amortiz amortization, you have about $40,000 in interest. So you can deduct that as well. And then lastly, what you can deduct is your property taxes, which would be about $12,000 on $1.2 million home. So in total, you're looking at $65,000 in deductions that you can currently use when you're filing your taxes. Now, under the worst case scenario, which fortunately we already passed and now it's, uh, it, um, it's, it's sort of more favorable for the housing market, uh, these are the numbers we would be looking at. I'm just gonna throw them all out there and then I'm gonna explain. So we would get the deduction, the mortgage interest deduction, the orange number going from $40,000 to, to, to uh, $20,000. That's if the uh, limit was uh, re uh, moved from $1 million uh, mortgage interest to $500,000. This is the part that has been uh, um, not put in place or, or, or we went away from that proposal, so we're, we, we're keeping it a million. So fortunately, we're keeping that additional $20,000. 12000 to 10000 is your uh, uh, property taxes, and that would remain uh, as it is uh, under uh, wh where we are at currently with the Senate proposal. So uh, you would be losing anything above the $10,000 in property taxes. And then lastly, you're not seeing the $13,000 at all, and that's because uh, you would be completely losing your deduction on state and local income. Now, uh, Fisher Center for Real Estate up in, uh, in Berkeley did an estimate of just what the state and local income deduction would do to the uh, local economy, and the estimate is $38 uh, billion uh, for middle and upper income Californians that would lose uh, in, in their um, money out of pocket, which uh, translates to about 2 to 3 percent lost in, uh, um, economic activity in, in California. Okay, so with that, I will move forward to talk more about local housing markets here. So in LA, we saw an average of about 8% appreciation rate over the, last, uh, over the last year. So the numbers that I'm looking at are year-to-date numbers. So we took first eight months, or first nine months of last year, or first nine months of this year, and then compared the numbers. Now at 8%, if you, if you had, um, a, a, 
potentially heard on the radio, I think yesterday, Kay Schiller came out uh, and showed that uh, nationally for the 20 largest uh, metropolitan areas, the appreciation, seasonal adjusted uh, annual growth was 9%, which was, again, the strongest uh, annual growth seen since 2013. So not just LA, but, and LA came slightly underneath with 8% versus this 9% nationally, but uh, uh, it, uh, uh, across most um, large metropolitan areas in LA, we're seeing really, really strong uh, home price appreciation. Okay, in the next uh, series of slides, I'm going to show you, sh this is a map of LA County, and uh, the, da the, 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 the coloration is of zip codes. Um, so you have a zip codes on the left-hand side, um, and then on the right-hand side is, is the city level data. So there are areas that we saw some uh, price, um, some price, prices lost steam. So what, I, what I'm looking at here is median home prices, so the uh, uh, or changes in median home prices. So if you did have more lower priced homes selling in one year, in this year versus last year, you would see that that uh, median coming down. Not necessarily that you saw the depreciation. Okay, so don't take this as, as a definite depreciation uh, message. But uh, Westlake Village, for example, as El Segundo were the two areas where we saw the most price. Um, losing steam, I, I call it that way. Um, and what's interesting about these two areas is that at the, uh, for the same period, the year prior, they were actually uh, showing double-digit appreciation or double-digit growth in this median median home price. So uh, you're, where you're seeing a lot of this um, prices losing steam are the areas that previously had a very strong uh, price growth. Um, the uh, the Last uh, the one, the few cities on the bottom here, you know, they're just a, a negative one or two percent. You could call that even. So no, no really well, price changes in those areas. Um, one thing to no note, I do want to uh, actually uh, point it out. San Marino, for example, San Marino is is a primarily Chinese market, right? Um, and that that market did lose steam uh, as a result of changes to the capital inflow inflow um, restrictions in China. So so that market has been affected. Um, now, we're looking at a set of markets where the price growth was from 0 to 10 percent, so this average 8 percent uh, price growth. This is the majority of, of um, LA markets. And on the right-hand side, you can see the list of cities. I hope you can see that. I can't quite tell if it's very hard to read. It may be a little bit hard to read. But um, on, on the top, the top markets is the, the uh, lower single-digit uh, uh, appreciation rates. Uh, and those are generally the markets in, uh, in, the, in the South Valley or in the Valley. Uh, this is Van Nuys, Calabasas, uh, Woodland Hill, Sherman Oaks, and then where you move down the um, down the range to up to the 10%. Those are the areas that are closer to the central LA and more adjacent to those to the higher priced or high, more let's say more desirable, more where more demand is 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 in LA, such as Culver City, uh, LA, Studio City, Highland Park, so areas adjacent to to central LA. Now where we we saw double-digit percent uh, median price growth. That means anything from 10 to 20 percent are these areas in yellow. And what's interesting about, uh, about them is several things. First, you see, again, areas that are adjacent to the highly, to those areas that previously saw high appreciation, such as Inglewood, Compton. We did have Rams come here, so I think that's helping that market possibly down there. But then again, uh, you know, the, the immediately adjacent area to, to uh, highly desired area, so Valley, Valley Glen, Toluca Lake, uh, Altadena, uh, North Hollywood. North Hollywood had a interesting, strong appreciation this year. Um, and then on the other hand, you're seeing areas that really benefited from the tech industry, so the Silicon Beach. So we're talking about Manhattan Beach, we're talking about Venice, uh, to some extent Pacific Palisades. When you looked at the, their numbers last year, uh, they were actually one of those losing steam markets They would have been in red, but they now showed a uh, uh, you know, really strong um, return in, in, in buyer sentiment due to the, the presence of the tech industry. And then lastly, where demand, I call that where demand surge is just the areas that we had really, really strong appreciation, over 20%, and those were uh, our standard high and high demand uh, luxury markets of Beverly Hills, Playa Vista again, um, 
was helped by the by the tech industry, and then you have South, South Pasadena also uh, has been doing really well this year. And then there are a couple of markets in South LA, um, and those are again adjacent uh, to to those to those uh, Baldwin Hills, Ladera Heights that previously were growing really strong. Now had a little bit lower uh, rate of appreciation, but then you know it was sort of a domino. You see that domino effect of neighborhoods, uh, each adjacent neighborhood, then starts getting that very high appreciation. Um, so now when you put it all this together, um, you know, it's very hard maybe to come up with some, some consistent story in, in terms of the, the, how the distribution or, or what really the story is. But I will point out that uh, what we are seeing in LA is very similar to what we saw in, in, in the Bay Area. Uh, and the message was the same, where uh, the areas that were previously gaining a lot of um, uh, uh, um, median price growth have slowed down, and then the ag areas just adjacent to them now did see a lot of appreciation. Again, uh, uh, job growth, uh, access to transit, uh, and then affordability, areas with a lot of affordability, um, those were all the areas that, that we saw a lot of uh, appreciation over the last year. So, so does that mean that the, the, the neighborhoods last year that appreciated the most, they became unaffordable, and the adjacent one that was affordable became popular? Right, right, exactly, <clears throat> exactly. Um, so now in terms of the buyer competition, uh, what I'm looking at here is how many homes sold over the asking price, so how competitive the buyers were amongst themselves. 42% of all homes uh, in 2017 we were in 2017, sold over the asking price, uh, so 42%. And this is up for, from 38% last year. So there is some increase in, in buyer competition. To give you uh, some reference, uh, San Francisco, the Bay Area, had about 67, 68% of homes selling over the asking price, and they also saw higher rates this year than they, they saw last year. Areas in, uh, in LA that were more than 42% were actually in that 60, 70% range, were for example, South Pasadena, uh, East LA, uh, uh, and those uh, more affordable neighborhoods where buyers are really, you know, trying to get it, to get in. And then, in terms of how much. Uh, buyers were willing to pay over the asking price for homes that sold over the asking price. It was on, uh, on average about 4% premium, um, and this was down from 6%. Not everywhere, though. For example, Malibu uh, was one of the areas where, where buyers were much more eager to pay over the asking price. Uh, Eagle Rock, actually, let me uh, just get to that slide in a second. But um, overall, affordable neighborhoods are still seeing more bidding wars, um, and then uh, premiums, uh, they're, uh, they're higher in these an in, in interesting set of neighborhoods, but one of them is Eagle Rock in South LA, but then also Malibu, Topanga, South Pasadena. So overall, what I can, what I would uh, uh, emphasize is that job growth and wealth creation is what has been driving LA markets, and very similar to what we saw in the Bay Area as well. So with that, I'm going to turn over back to Mark, and we can talk about a little bit about uh, condominiums. Thank you, Zama. So I'm going to share a perspective on the condo market in Los Angeles County, and shortly after that, or, or immediately after that, we're going to go to questions. So two microphones have been brought down to either side of the stage. If you have a question for John or for Selma, please step up and, and we'll, go, we'll go through them. So um, the Los Angeles uh, condo market, this research is largely developed by the Mark Company um, and to the benefit of any developers that might be in the audience or online. So what you're looking at here is new construction supply, demand, and pricing index. The supply of new condos being developed in Los Angeles County is in orange. The index of the pricing index is in yellow. It's the line across the top, okay? And then the units traded or the absorption are the dark lines across the bottom. And you, so you can see that post-recession, there was really no supply coming online because there were no buildings coming out of the ground. So we hit peak supply of about 700 units a month in April, uh, excuse me, in January, February, and March of 2016. And then as absorption took place, the inventory began to, began to burn off. So right now we have about 400 units of supply on the market. Okay, and we're closing about 20 units a month in the last six months. So that says we have about 20 months worth of inventory in the condo market. And it's, it's interesting, and I'd love to have John and Selma's opinion, but in a marketplace where it, the affordability, it, it seems to be driving absorption, 
<clears throat> maybe these con we, maybe Alan or Kristen could tell us, are these condos priced above market? Are they just in non-desirable locations? Because it seems like a lot of supply against the absorption. Um, in terms of new supply, what, what this is is really the Los Angeles pipeline, the opportunity for development. Um, condos under construction currently is about 1,000 units. Apartments under construction trying to meet the job demand is about 11,000 units. Uh, condos that have been approved are about 1,100, or about 1,700, 1,800 units, and apartments have been approved about 3,700 units. And then more inventory is under review, entitlements and things like that, by local municipalities, 15, 000, almost 15,000 uh, apartment units and almost 5,000 condominium units. So there seems to be a lot more supply coming in a marketplace that's supply constrained and in an absorption that's really not taking them off the market just yet. So it's a dynamic that I'm sure frustrates some of the developers and some of the people selling condos. I see some smiles. Um, so that's the snapshot of the condominium market down here. And if you have specific questions on any of that, we can always engage Alan and Kristen during the Q&A. So at this point, I'd like to open it up to questions to anybody that might have a question for John or Selma or myself. Maybe join me here on the stage. Yes, Steve. Yeah, yeah, this is all MLS. Unfortunately, it's hard to kind of talk about numbers when they don't go through MLS, so. Hi. Um, so I'm wondering, are there any potential U.S. policy changes that have the ability to greatly impact our Los Angeles area on the horizon? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I, I showed you the percentage of foreign born, and if we shut the borders, uh, that would be massive. I'll, I'll, I'll share with you some controversial data on that, though. It, it, this is government data, and I believe it. The net migration from Mexico really back and forth has been zero since 2010. Um, and there's lots of data to prove, and just look at the labor shortages that we're seeing. The immigration has shifted and we've lost a lot of our construction labor, but what is brought in instead is a lot of affluent people who've made a lot of money in China and other places who are coming here as, as home buyers. So um, the, the, the big shift there is we lost our labor, but we, we've, we're getting buyers. Um, so the immigration policy makes a big difference. And I'll point out, it's not just our policy, it's their policies, and she alluded to it also. Them cracking down on you being able to take your money with you can impact us too. So it's not just our policies that can be the foreign government policies. Yeah, we've seen the influx of capital from mainland China to the state of California be cut in half in the last, what, 18 months since June of 16 when they changed their right. capital policies? What about income taxes? I mean, I know it's a wild card because we don't know what it is yet, but that's discretionary spending right there. Yeah, no, I mean, she, she, she handled that beautifully, and so we're keeping a close eye on that. But I want to give you maybe a national perspective on this. So um, only 13% of all homes in the country transacting this year are above 500 grand, let alone a million. And only 3% of homeowners have a mortgage over $500,000 and above. So if you're looking at this from a Washington D's, no, that's right, because you can hardly find anybody in the middle of the country that does. And in fact, you know, a third of homeowners have their mortgage paid off at this point because they're in their 60s and 70s and 80s. I know it's a different story in California, but I want to give you the national perspective because it is a national perspective that is passing policy, not an LA perspective. Yes. So, so the question, so everybody can hear it, is do we, do we see going forward any price adjustments coming in LA? And I think John's got some thunder on that after the Q&A, but you can talk to it. Yeah, just we're, we're, we're continuing to project price appreciation here. I mean, the fundamentals are supporting it. So the demand is running faster than the supply. So it's support, I mean, the minute that changes, we will ch we'll change our forecast. Maybe share with everybody the forecast that you gave in the Bay Area and the tech industry's impact on yeah, housing. Yeah, no, I'm much more concerned about a tech bubble then, I mean, we, we looked at all the sectors of the economy that could cause a recession. This is not one of them. <laughs> Real estate this time around is lending. I know the prices have gotten high, 
the loans are being documented, the builders are having to put down a lot of equity, there's not a lot of construction, uh, but what is going on in other sectors of the economy, what's going on in healthcare is crazy, what's going on in tech is crazy, the auto and retailers are getting disrupted. So there's a lot of things to pay attention to, um, but tech is the one we're very concerned about, and so uh, we think, because the valuations are idiotic, yeah. honestly. <laughs> yeah. They're, they're is that for, a tech, tech, technical yeah. term? <laughs> <laughs> well, and I'm, I'm sure I'm going to be proven wrong on some of those 190 companies that are valued at a billion dollars, all of which are losing money right now. I'm sure some of them are going to make it. I don't think all 190 are. Um, share, can share I, with, oh, go ahead, Selma. I just, if I could add to that, you know, Evaluation aside, I do think we're going to continue seeing uh, uh, growth in employment, uh, job sector, uh, job sector, uh, and uh, tech, job growth in tech sector, because just with all the industries being disrupted, and and technology penetrating all the industries and and turning them upside down, I think we'll, we will continue to see growth in in tech jobs, and I think uh, LA will benefit from that. John, in New York, you shared a perspective with everybody on the difference between, you know, the 2009 correction and a hiccup. Maybe just yeah. articulate that. Well, since 1971, there's been seven corrections. Four of them were really brutal downturns, and three of them are what I would calling were hiccups. Two, two of those three hiccups were caused by a stock market correction. The other was some international issues and rising interest rates. Until we can find some, something that's going to cause a heavy downturn, it looks to me like the next recession for our business, which is not being overbuilt, would be more of a hiccup. And, if, and if you, I mean, one thing I think I can guarantee is the economy starts to soften and go into recession, the Fed is not going to be raising rates. <laughs> so I, I think we're a little bit insulated there. But you, you never know what can happen. Another question? Yeah, just, so just to, uh, the, what would you say are some of the biggest challenges then for the LA housing market? Anything specifically that maybe you can see on the horizon? Um, do you want to handle it? Um, I think affordability, you know, as, as, as that being even the, the highest risk on, on your spectrum, uh, I think we really, we do have, you know, we are creating a lot of uh, higher paying jobs, but, you know, we already have 10 million people living here with, you know, I don't know what our um, uh, home ownership rate is, but I think it's about 50%, maybe a little bit off here. Um, anyways, we have a lot of renters, you know, that, that work here and, and they, they try to, you know, maybe I'm talking just from my personal experience, but <laughs> I think there are a lot of people like me, so, you know, not, not to, not to under, you know, underestimate the power of that. So, um, you know, I think affordability, yeah, affordability. There's a, bu there's a buying signal coming from Selma, just, just in case anyone's listening. <laughs> it's question. also a great tee-up to ask for a raise. <laughs> yeah, right, so, yeah. You know, <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, you, you mentioned in uh, sorry, you mentioned in the tech industry a potential bubble, and obviously that affecting the San Francisco market yeah. quite heavily because of a lot of the, the tech industry companies are based in that area. With the emergence of Silicon Beach and a lot of tech companies moving there, second offices or even Snapchat, for instance, a, a company that bases itself here. Should that happen to the tech industry, how do you think that would play out in the LA market? Does it hit certain areas more than others or because of the other industries? Yeah, I mean, it, 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 as your point out, it's company specific. So I don't know which ones would get hit the most. Uh, I, I will say that the 2000, 2001 tech correction hit the apartment market far harder than it hit the for sale market because <laughs> most of those tech people, even though they're making good bucks, are renters. So um, I, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't lose any sleep about it at this point. Sorry to follow on to that. Um, when you showed the graph with actually the, the growth in uh, salaries and that is actually above that 100,000 or yeah. that 200,000 mark, do you think that is part to do with tech? That, yes. Let so me, so let, me I, I, let me repeat the question. So the question was with the growth in the job sector above 100,000 income level, does that have an impact on the housing? Well, the, the growth was in the tech sector. So yes, a tech correction would slow our job growth and would slow our high income job growth for sure. But also to Selma's point, because of what's going on in tech, every single company, including Pacific Union, is hiring tech people and, and affluent tech people. So I, I still think the tech jobs 
more than last time are more protected because everybody is searching for tech talent, even if your business has been around for a century. Question up here. Yeah, Selma, who is your broker? <laughs> <laughs> So uh, I come from the blue box on that graph. I'm a child of the 50s, uh, and I'm concerned about my kids and their ability to stay in Los Angeles. So my question is, what can we do to enhance their affordability? And, and of course, my, you know, my concern is mostly on the west side, but the bigger picture is just in all of Los Angeles. What can we do for our kids? I think the most simple answer is build more. <laughs> I know, you know, it's it, that's basically our problem. We're just not building enough. And John, you know, pointed to that the uh, population growth versus the new construction growth is just out of balance. And until we start building more, we're going to see appreciation rates being higher than we can afford our generation. Yeah, the, so. the, the good news, bad news is LA is one of the most desirable places to live in the world. Yeah, <laughs> and we're running out of land. We got this thing to the west of us that's not going to let us build out there. <laughs> and, uh, but it, it, and, well, maybe they will. Um, but it's going to become, a, no matter what we do to solve these issues, it's going to become a permanently more expensive place to live, just like Hong Kong, just like China, Shanghai, just all, the, all these other places. And um, I think there's a lot we can do to help it a little bit, but uh, really I think that's the issue. And so you just gonna have to sell more homes so you can make a down payment so your kids can stay here. And <laughs> last year, John, you shared that wealth transfer, it's like a $13 trillion number from the generation above me that yeah. is gonna end up in the younger kids' so, hands. So that 1950s generation is all turning 65 over the next 10 years with more net worth than any generation before them by a long shot. So if you're one of the members of the Lucky Sperm Club <laughs> and, and, and your dad and mom are in there, then you're going to do better um, than, than others. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a really creative answer. <laughs> okay, we have another question. Uh, yeah, hi. Um, we've touched about you know, on the Silicon Beach and the tech jobs. And what I'm seeing you know, from Playa Vista going from short sales you know, in 2007, to this explosive growth. But Hawthorne is going crazy because Elon Musk is doing the Loop project down there. And I have clients who sold at four times what they purchased at two years ago. So, I mean, I see the 105 going out to Norwalk because we have the, the freeway there and the rail line. And I see, with Toyota leaving, the opportunity for the tech companies to be moving further south for more affordable office space. What data are you seeing to support that? We're, I mean, we're, not, we're trying to track that data. Um, and I, don't, I don't have a lot to support it, but, but that, that's a great question. So I will give me your card when we're done and I'll go see what I can find and I'll get back to you. Selma? Yeah, I actually do have a statistic on Silicon Beach where you know I was talking about how many homes sold over the asking price. Um, and above 3 million in, in Silicon Beach, 67% of homes above 3 million sold over the asking price, which is, you know, if you look across other neighborhoods, it's, it's much higher than, than, than other neighborhoods. And then another thing I was going to say oh, about the tech, um, you know, tech is, it, it's sort of a new, I, I, if I could call it a new phenomenon of Silicon Beach relative to, to the Bay Area, it's relatively a new phenomenon. And, and it's so much question about questioning around what is it going to do to, to LA and if it's going to have the same impact that they had in Silicon Valley. Um, and, and it's not, it's just not enough data. Well, at least, you know, I haven't dwelt, dealt a depth of that, but, but it's not a lot of data, data yet about what the impact of these tech companies locally really is. Right, right. The they haven't cashed out yet. <laughs> the, the comment for those listening online is a lot of the investors in the Silicon, a lot of the purchasing in Silicon Beach is going on through investors that are running back to the jobs that are being created there. 
And that ties directly into my question, okay. which is how does the uh, affordability factor of the housing, is that being affected by investors putting capital into the market and driving prices up versus the organic natural price growth based on people trying to purchase a home? You know, so we actually collect data on that and the data surprises me. So I wondered if there's something wrong with the data, um, but we're seeing a pretty consistent level of investor activity over the last decade as a percentage of total transactions. Now I'm sure it has shifted. Um, and the way we do that is we, we compare the property address to the address where the property tax bill goes and uh, the percentages stayed relatively consistent. So I think the answer is more, but I can't prove it out in the data. Question here. I have uh, more clients asking me about accessory dwelling units in Los Angeles, and I'm wondering, Selma, what impact do you think that's going to have on prices and affordability and just housing availability? Yeah, so there was a paper um, from uh, the Lusk Center, uh, Richard Green uh, looked at the, how many homes we would need right now. If you just, I think he said if you just dropped 500,000 units in, central, in, in LA County, you would need to, to keep the prices at, at where they are. So we, you know, to, to sort of lower that, that, that affordability factor, I mean, to, to help with the affordability. But uh, you know, I, I'm, I, I don't understand why, I mean, we are, you know, LA is ironically one of the densest metropolitan area in LA, I mean, in, in, in the nation, uh, but it's all single family homes. So I always think to myself, you know, I go hiking to Runyon Canyon and then I sit there and I look at, you know, what the low density we have. If you, and as far as you're, you're, I can see, it's one, up to four story uh, homes. And I thought to myself, if you could just add one story <laughs> to all of these units uh, in central LA, LA, you would you would you know contribute significantly to to the supply problem. So I think accessory units are our must at this point. I mean that's our only solu you know temporary solution you know or short term solution. Um, so so one of my clients who just came here from Japan builds forty thousand homes a year in Japan, and the typical model is they buy a lot and put four homes on it. So just to think about it as a way to all of a sudden increase for exactly what you said, it was an old home and now we can put four smaller ones or, or a higher density. Um, the other thing, and this is gonna sound a little crazy, this is why I'm gonna preface it this way. So if I'd stood up here seven years ago and said, I think a million people are going to spend the night in strangers' houses every single night, <laughs> you would have said this guy is an idiot. But that's what's going on with Airbnb. And uh, their fastest growing landlord base, we got a testimonial in our book on this from um, Chip Conley at Airbnb, is homeowners with empty bedrooms who need extra income in retirement. And what do we have all over here? Um, and so I think what is going to shift is instead of renting out to a stranger every week, you're gonna see more people renting out to a permanent tenant for the year. And as I've been presenting this over the last year or so, a number of people come up to me afterwards and say, that's exactly what I'm doing. And we're using the extra $800 a month to take a vacation or to buy Christmas presents for the grandkids or to stay in our house. Uh, I think that's a societal shift that's gonna be very interesting to play out and the cities do not have to approve that. The ADUs, they have to approve. Um, so that's gonna be very interesting to see. Do we have one last question? Back center. Oh. Um, is there any data or research that, or have you guys looked into how maybe cryptocurrencies are going to affect the uh, the California market, if not just LA? Is that is that the Bitcoin thing you mean? It's the Bitcoin yeah. thing, yeah. <laughs> that thing over my, pay, over my pay grade. Yeah, <laughs> and we have people online in China who aren't allowed to use this now. They just passed that law, so. Um, it is a great way for people to buy homes uh, completely undetected, so it's drug money is kind of the nice way of saying it. Or, or somebody who got very lucky, and I think it's a very, very, very small percentage of transactions. I, that's the only color I've got on it. Um, but there are people that want, there are people, like in New York now, if you're, in, if you're from Russia, and you want to buy a home, a penthouse in Manhattan, you can't because you have to dis disclose who it is and they report back to Russia who it is. Now with Bitcoin, you can't. 
that's what it's designed for, if you ask me. Okay, we have one last question in the back somewhere. So if you said that one of the highest risks in Los Angeles is the uh, housing affordability, and based on your slide, the tax reform bill is going to make it even more unaffordable for people who need mortgages here. Do you see a softening in the market coming up if that gets passed? No, well, not, no. And that's because people usually don't, you know, mortgage interest deduction is not the primary reason people buy homes. You know, they buy a home because they want to buy a home, and they buy a home whether it's, you know, they get married, they have children, you know, it's a, in some sort of event in their life that, that leads them to that. It's not like, oh, I, I need an, a deduction, so I'm going to buy a home, you know, majority of them. Um, so that's on one hand. The other hand is, you know, we were talking about how many millennials are coming into that age of home buying and how undersupplied the market is. So we do those two factors playing, again, Against each other, I, I just don't don't see that you know impacting. Yeah, I'll, I'll say it another way. I, I didn't I didn't agree with the statement that affordability is a risk. I, I think affordability never causes a downturn. It just when a recession happens and you have an affordability problem, the downturns are really bad. So I think that's the way to look at it. And I think what this could do is it'll take a lot of first time buyers who are trying to buy the 1.2 million dollar home. That maybe not out of the market, but force them into a, a, a more affordable home. So there should be some, some less price appreciation or some softening of demand there, I think. But if we're still adding 50,000 jobs and only building 20,000 housing units and have two to three months of supply on the market, I completely agree. I think prices continue to appreciate. That is a perfect transition to our outlook for 2020. OK. You ready? Yeah. <laughs> Can you give me, I'll do it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I was just testing. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, who knows? But, but, the, the, but the, this is our best estimate. Thank you. Um, <laughs> it looks like we're heading for a 6% year. We've been pretty close the last few years. I mean, the demand is exceeding supply and supporting this and then a 5% year, and then we're, cause, we're calling for a basically no growth or maybe getting close to a recession in 2020, so we're calling for a slowdown. And I showed you earlier that would also be a 4.8% mortgage rate year. So th that's basically what the fundamentals are saying. Something can come out of left field, or you can see irrational exuberance that could see a, a lot more than that. But that, that's what we're planning on, which is a total of 13%. I mean, that's pretty, pretty solid. And this is more optimistic than our view nationally because of the lack of su the supply constraints here. And more optimistic than what we just shared in the Bay Area two weeks ago. Right. Yeah. So the Dodgers beat the Giants again. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, um, so you want me to all, talk to you? Yeah, why don't you talk to this one? You can take so it out. So all of us, when we go to social events, people ask us what's going on in the market, who are the buyers, things like that. And we answer it. And if we ever answer with a tone that is, it's slowing down, um, it's less frothy, things like that, people's minds always go to that time frame right there. It's still so raw and fresh in our minds, that steep decline that we had that really kind of started nationally at, in 05 and finished in maybe 09 or 010. It's very fresh in everybody's minds. So that's a declining market. This is an accelerating market market that we experienced from 2011 all the way till 2016, maybe even 17 here. And what John just indicated is we're going to start to experience a deceleration in the market. Not necessarily next year, well it's decelerating from 8 to 6, but it's, it's starting to level off. That's still a fantastic market. But what you have to remember when you tell somebody that it's decelerating and slowing down a little bit, it's not the decline. And that's the dynamic, Selma and John, I'd love to have you weigh in here, but that's the dynamic that we face every day in a living room or in a social environment. Yeah, you had to boil everything down to a sound bite, it seems. Yeah, but, but, yeah. Um, continued appreciation. Yes. Right. Selma, any thoughts? No, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> well, on behalf of Selma and John, we want to thank you all for being here tonight. Um, thank you. I, I want to thank everybody from uh, John Arrow Group, from Partners Trust, from The Mark Company, from Empire Online, and everybody else in the online audience. We'll see you again next year.